I hope we are all keeping well and staying safe. It's my pleasure again to welcome you to this special webinar. Lagos Business School Sustainability Center is happy to host you all for this very important discussion on COVID-19 in Africa and the impact on medical products and technology. The disruptive effects of this coronavirus named COVID-19 have been felt in every sector. However, the impact on the healthcare sector cannot be overemphasized. It has exposed the very fragile healthcare infrastructure or system in Africa. And that's why we're here today. And as Africa is starting to see exponential growth in the number of COVID-19 infections, decision makers can now use the large sums of money allocated allocated for the emergency response to save lives now, while also considering how they can make prudent investment decisions that build greater health system that is resilient and looking into the future. It is time for Africa to take a long-term view in healthcare investments and spend more because we're not spending enough. We should strive to build robust and well-funded healthcare ecosystems that are digitally driven, bearing in mind that we have a young population that we can call digital natives. How can we ensure reliable access to high quality medical commodities and equipment? This is the time for us to rethink our business model in this sector. I would like to congratulate Bloom Public Health for this initiative and thank our speakers and partners for supporting this webinar. Welcome again, and we look forward to an engaging session that will be extremely fruitful and will help our leaders to reshape the future of healthcare in Africa. Welcome. Thank you, Professor Weche. Um, Bloom Public Health is indeed happy to co-host this webinar with Lagos Business School Sustainability Center. Good morning and thank you everyone from all over the world for joining us. Bloom Public Health is a public health organization born out of the need to create an African-driven sustainable solution to solve African issues in the public health space, especially in the pharma sector. It is this, the most innovative minds and forges global partnerships to design interventions that are tailored to the continent. Bloom's mission is to provide the most trusted, timely, reliable, and sustainable services in the areas of supply chain management, pharmaceutical quality systems, and policy for public health. We are privileged to partner with World Health Organization Nigeria, Nigeria Health Watch, and I thank you for partnering with us. It is my honor to introduce our distinguished speakers. We have today, Professor Omoji Adeyeye. She is the Director General of Nigeria's National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control, where she's leading regulatory and administrative reforms through quality management approach. She's a scholar and an emeritus professor of pharmaceutics, drug product development and evaluation at the College of Pharmacy, Roosevelt University, Illinois. She has authored over 600 peer reviewed research articles. She's an inventor and author of six patents. We welcome you, Ma. We have Professor Paul Newton. I mean, he's a professor of tropical medicine and a honorable consultant physician, Center for Tropical Medicine and Global Health. Paul Newton, in the last 24 years, in Laos, Southeast Asia, but recently returned to the UK. He works on infectious disease epidemiology and management, and on the epidemiology, detection, prevention, and response to substandard and falsified medicines. He is the head of IDO Medical Medicine Quality Research Group at the Center for Tropical Medicine and Global Health, Churchill Univers Hospital, University of Oxford. You're welcome, Prof. Paul Newton. We also have Dr. Patrick Lukule. Patrick is the CEO of Tech for Health Africa. 
as an accomplished pharmaceutical research and global health professional with extensive experience in reputable pharmaceutical companies and global health organizations. He is the chairman of the advisory board for Boston University's Pharma Check Technology for Dictation of Poor Quality Medicines, a member of the International Pharmaceutical Federation for Substandard of Falsified Medicines, and a former VP of Global Public Health, United States Pharmacopoeia. We we'll still have here Professor Martins Emeje. Professor Martins is the head Advanced Biology and Chemistry Laboratories, Center for Nanomedicine and Biophysical Drug Delivery at the National Institute of Pharmaceutical Research and Development, that's NIPRID. He was the immediate past chairman, Nigeria Association of Pharmacists in Academia. He's the lead researcher and protection holder to the first herbal trimodial supportive therapy in COVID-19. We also have the WHO Nigeria representative, Tayona Hamzat, who is a pharmacist and seasoned public health professional, um, practitioner with extensive experience in supply chain management of health commodities. Omotayo currently works in WHO, where he provides technical assistance to the country to ensure equitable access to quality assured, safe, efficacious, and cost-effective medicines. As an overview to the topic of discussion today, we know that the current COVID-19 pandemic has shaken even the strongest health systems and has definitely threatened the weak system, health systems like ours in Nigeria and that of most low and middle income countries. Again, medicines, um, medical products, vaccines and technologies is one of the WHO's six building blocks of the health system. And access to quality medicines and health products is an indicator to measure a country's progress towards universal health coverage. Currently, local manufacture is plagued by poor infrastructure and lack of protection from unfair international competition and only supplies about 5% of the local needs of essential medicines. Therefore, Nigeria, like other African countries, largely depends on importation to meet their local needs for medicines. And it is said that over 70% of our drugs are imported Nigeria, like other low middle income countries, depend on imported active pharmaceutical ingredients used in drug manufacturing. Now, with emergency efforts to find optimal medical products to manage COVID-19 and the devices in the COVID-19 pandemic came the influx and proliferation of falsified and substandard um, products. And we start preparation for quality assurance of diagnostic tests, medicines and vaccines, the world risks a parallel pandemic of falsified and substandard products, not just Africa, but globally. And this poses a threat to us all. So we need to plan strategically to ensure manufacture access, protection, and monitoring of supply chains in the face of inescapable shortages, cost increases, and national hoarding to guarantee access to safe and quality assured and effective medical products in Africa. Nigeria and other African countries need to look at lessons learned and build on them to ensure uninterrupted medicines and health technology supply during pandemics. So let's get this discussion started. I'll come to you, Professor Paul Newton. What are the effects of COVID-19 on the medical products and technology supply chain and the implications on low and middle income countries? Professor Paul, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Chioma. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. I'm greatly honored to be asked to speak on this uh, webinar. Um, very grateful to uh, Bloom and to the uh, Lagos Business School for organizing this. It's a terribly important subject and um, I'll try and cover an overview of some of the uh, uh, current issues. So as we, uh, many people globally working to try and ensure uh, which diagnostic tests, which medicines prevention and treatment of COVID and which vaccines may be appropriate. This has exposed enormous gaps uh, in every country in the world. Um, and I think 
we're all going through terribly difficult times, but I think during this time we have together all having uh, similar impacts that we should use this communal experience to try and think how we would like the future to be, to have, uh, to use this to argue for systems for equitable and affordable access to good quality medicines, to try to plan for a better future post pandemic and to try and work together in the meantime to cope with the inevitable uh, parallel delayed pandemic of substantial and falsified medicines that Dr. Choma mentioned earlier. So at the moment, I think there are about 180 different vaccine development products all over the world, and there are already 14 in um, clinical trials. And there are hundreds of APIs being trialed, both repurposed and NCEs, new chemi uh, chemical entities, with in over 1,000 clinical trials. And there'll be lots of publicity uh, in the last few months about chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and uh, uh, anti, uh, uh, antivirals such as remesivir. One of the key problems that we're facing acutely are shortages of medicines, presumably fueled by, both by the relatively small number of factories who, which make API, a lot of them in Asia, um, which is like the, the source of the bulk API used in much of the manufacturing. And again, there are for factories that uh, compound and manufacture medicines from API, for many of the medicines that we're needing, they're relatively few. And they're relatively concentrated in relatively few countries. And then we have the uh, really difficult disruption of transport systems uh, by plane and by sea um, and by road that make the uh, supply chains uh, a logistic uh, nightmare for uh, trying to get medicines to where they're needed. In Europe and North America, there have been reports of severe shortages of midazolam, propofol, and ketamine, vital for ICU care. There are obviously, you well know about the reports of hydroxychloroquine shortages impacting on patients with uh, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis not being able to get the uh, hydroxychloroquine or if they can get it at vastly increased uh, cost. And so it has been increasing costs, not just of uh, putative anti-COVID medicines, but also for um, all essential medicines, in part because of disruption of, of production and uh, disruption of supply chains. So there can be difficult choices ahead should many factories, when we know which medicines will work well for COVID and save lives, should pharmaceutical factories stop production of other essential medicines and divert to making this? And how do we ensure that happens in a joined up way? Otherwise could exacerbate shortages for uh, non-COVID diseases and cause uh, significant harm as a result of that. And all the, uh, the severe financial stress that it's causing both uh, national governments, the international community, patients and their families, and uh, villages and, and, and towns. So shortages is something that uh, I think needs to be addressed very, uh, very acutely and to have some form of system for mapping where shortages are, some form of joined up international system that I gather is being discussed would be one way of trying to uh, ensure that for now and even better post pandemic, we have systems that uh, allow shortages to be identified and for them to be eliminated. As we know, there have been uh, outbreaks of uh, problems of substandard and falsified medicines. There have been reports very recently in the last few weeks of falsified chloroquine containing no or wrong active ingredients or minimal active ingredients in uh, the DRC and um, Cameroon. In Nepal, there have been uh, uh, deaths because of uh, the use of methanol rather than ethanol in uh, hand sanitizer through transcutaneous absorption. In the UK, there have been falsified uh, hand sanitizing gel containing the toxic compound uh, glutaraldehyde that's been banned for cutaneous use for many years in the UK. 
and also falsified masks and gowns. The UK government bought uh, tens of thousands of masks and gowns and diagnostic tests only to find that they, they didn't work. And I'm afraid the UK has been uh, a lesson in this. I've, the first report I can find of falsification with COVID was the shipment of, of falsified COVID diagnostic tests when there weren't any approved a few months ago and somebody in London was arrested for sending these to the US. Um, and there also been lots of uh, what was called during the enormous outbreaks of plague in Europe uh, between four and 800 years ago during the, the great plagues, um, lots of quackery was uh, happening and that's resurfaced with people arguing that garlic and cow feces and arsenic should be used to prevent and, and treat um, COVID. Uh, so many uh, uh, really difficult issues that are um, affecting people's health. Think very hard to know what as individuals we can do about this apart from to argue for more attention to these problems, more investment and more innovative thinking. We need to remain alert to these problems when we buy medicines for ourselves and our families. And if we have any suspicions to report to the National Regulatory Authority and to the WHO a rapid alert system. There are many other consequences of COVID, such as the uh, financial impact on regulatory authorities uh, and the difficulties they will have in inspecting factories um, because of their problems of physical uh, distancing. We need to integrate the WHO prevent, detect, response system for falsified uh, medicines uh, and uh, innovate now. And at the moment in our group, we're trying to uh, discuss with partners about how to tabulate and map companies that are making medicines that we hope could be used for COVID so that the procurers would be able to have a one-stop place where they could go to on the web to see, okay, where is the nearest place that may be making this, uh, the medicine that they need, um, which would be a reliable source and also linked to trade routes because there's been a big disruption of trade routes. So it would be really useful to be able to map this with also the, the dynamic changes in, in trade routes between and within countries. There's been lots of discussion in the last few years about uh, portable devices such as Raman and Near Infrared the Minilab, et cetera, that be, could be used to empower drug inspectors. And I think it would be really important to uh, investigate which of the desires, these devices may be uh, useful for empowering, empowering drug inspectors uh, when 7.8 billion people need these uh, medicines that when they're approved. And the other issue is that when we know which medicines those are going to be, there's going to be enormous pressure to produce as many medicines as possible, as rapidly as possible. And that will inevitably lead to substandard production. So there needs to be some way of medicine regulatory adapting so that we can try and ensure the quality of, of the medicines for COVID and other essential uh, medicines. Um, so thank you very much. That's a brief overview of the concerns that our group has had. Um, thank you very much. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paul, for that um, discussion. High points. I'll come back to you later. So, Professor Moji Adeyeye, the DJ of NAPDAGMA, um, what lessons have we learned in Nigeria from the effects of the pandemic on um, medical products? We've listened to some of the experiences Paul has shared with us. And I'm also aware that um, we had Paul, and I happen to be on that group as well with you, Prof, on a publication in April. Um, Paul, with his team of collaborators, and myself and Prof Mujade happened to be on that group that published in the Lancet Statement about some calling the global attention on the possibilities of um, um, the effects of this COVID 19 on the medicine supply chain. So, Prof, Ma, 
Can you share with us what lessons we have learned in Nigeria from the effect of the pandemic on medical products? What approaches have we adopted so far to tackle the effects of this COVID-19 on the medicines technology supply chain? You have the floor, Ma. Thank you very much. Uh, it is good to be here. COVID-19 and impact on regulation of medical products in NAVDAC. Uh, it has been a wild wind uh, in terms of uh, what is taking place. Uh, after the pandemic started, a wild win for a regulatory agency because we were caught by surprise and everything stopped and we had to focus on COVID-19. Uh, there was complete lockdown in selected states, uh, Lagos, Ogun, and uh, the Federal Capital Territory. So we have to quickly start using adaptive regulatory activities. Uh, only essential workers were in place. For NAPDAC, uh, and this includes, of course, the Director General's Office, Registration Regulatory Affairs, Drug Evaluation and Research, Laboratory Services, Ports Investigation and Enforcement. Uh, this directorate and offices have to be kept open because we have so many commodities uh, that we have to uh, evaluate or screen. Uh, that is in the headquarters and, the, and Lagos, this directorate. But work continued in other states uh, for some weeks without lock, lockdown, after a while, some of the states start getting locked down. There was high demand, of course, for COVID-19 medical products. Uh, everything got intensified. We started using expedited review, uh, but meticulous, nonetheless, uh, using the emergency use authorization approvals. A lot of our activities were being processed online. And this is actually a good thing uh, for NAVDAC because uh, we started online or digitalization about, uh, well, as soon as I actually arrived in NAVDAC. Uh, we started using Zoom uh, as early as 2018, you know, early part of 2018. And it is interesting that many people didn't know about Zoom in Nigeria until COVID. So it's a, COVID has a positive uh, side to it. Online meetings, of course, top management uh, meetings, uh, meetings with other regulatory agencies or healthcare settings uh, using Zoom, Microsoft Team, Google platform and so on. The different uh, product classes uh, include uh, protective, pers uh, personal protective equipment, PPE, and hand sanitizers, medical devices, in vitro diagnostic uh, test kits, uh, therapeutics. The for the PPEs and hand sanitizers, expedited approval uh, for change of source requests for medical gloves, there were too many things happening at the same time, but we have to expedite the approval process. We actually cut it down to 10 days uh, instead of the months that we have because we put, kind of pushed almost everything aside and started focusing at the beginning, especially focusing on some of these commodities. Uh, for for alcohol-based hand sanitizers, there was intensification uh, of submission <laughs> and approvals. Uh, we had about 21 uh, hand sanitizers companies in Nigeria before COVID. Now we have 110 hand sanitizers, over 110 uh, hand sanitizer companies. Uh, we were given expedited approval. We couldn't inspect the sites because of lockdown and because it was just at the beginning of 
the pandemic, we weren't even prepared to get all the PPEs that we needed. However, as I will be showing later, we went into the market. Post-marketing surveillance had to uh, go to the open market and we, spread, we started in Lagos and then spread it across the country because with the pandemic came uh, unregistered hand sanitizers, uh, falsified hand sanitizers, but we did our due diligence in terms of uh, post-marketing surveillance, include, which included mopping of many hand sanitizers from the, from the uh, market, uh, doing laboratory testing to know the level of uh, alcohol. There were some that had low levels of alcohols and we mopped them from the market. Uh, medical devices and in vitro diagnostics, uh, we have the medical face mask respirators, Ventilators, we didn't actually got into approved. Actually, we approved ventilators, you know. Uh, but we also relied on reliance. Uh, if the product is coming from a regulatory agencies that have uh, stringent uh, policies, we use that to do desk uh, review and uh, or using a bridge data. Uh, we had about 40 something applications and I believe we approved up to now about 18. Uh, for the face masks, we've, you know, of course, approved so many companies bringing in face masks and we had to then adapt quickly to testing uh, face masks. Ventilators, we did not because it came from the US. Uh, for the test kits, uh, we gave license to imports. Uh, actually, there are, I mentioned 12 products, but a lot of events have taken place since that time. Uh, documentation, uh, excuse me, expedited review of this rapid de de diagnostic test kits, documentation is being followed. Uh, and uh, once the test kits arrive in the country, that is the beginning of the next stage, which is full approval. So we give provisional approval, and then the importer has to do in-country uh, in validation at a government regulatory lab because we were not set up. We are now being set up to test uh, rapid diagnostic test kits or to evaluate, but right now, People are, you know, the importers are going to the different uh, labs to do validation, after which we then give full approval. Therapeutics, very interesting, uh, dramatic event uh, in terms of market authorization. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I envisaged that there would be a need for chloroquine after pouring over scientific literature, clinical data, uh, starting from China, uh, uh, France, US, where it was stated that uh, chloroquine may be effective. And uh, I asked a company that used to make chloroquine to make an emergency batch before the first index came into the country. Uh, that did not sit well in some quarters, but this is what a regulatory agency is supposed to do in terms of emergency. Anyhow, market authorization was granted. This is a company that was manufacturing before, and they have all the facilities and so on. Uh, but we then renewed their market authorization uh, we also gave permission to import hydroxychloroquine for clinical trial treatment only. Uh, market authorization was also given to, uh, for, for other therapeutics that could enhance uh, the treatment uh, regimen for, the, for uh, COVID patients. Uh, last year, I inaugurated uh, Harbor Medicine Product Committee in NAVDAC, March of last year. And we've, the goal is to bring researchers and practitioners together 
because there was a gap between them in terms of uh, trust. Uh, so we've been working on this, but the COVID-19 brought up a surge in submission of herbal medicines uh, for listing. We have two stages in our approval process. Uh, the listing stage is for safety evaluation. And then if the medicinal product is deemed safe, then the sponsor or the investigator can move on to clinical trial. Uh, but right now, no herbal preparations have been given in, uh, approval during this period because we have to go through uh, toxicity, microbial content tests, uh, phytochemistry, uh, you no know, different tests. Uh, efficacy and uh, where I've mentioned that the safety has to be established before the clinical trials. Uh, during this pandemic, NAVDAC has continued to ensure the supply of PPEs, medical devices, test kits, vital drugs for clinical uh, trial treatments. Uh, reliance and desk review are being used, I mentioned that. And uh, post-marketing surveillance is is part and parcel of NAVDAC, but now, well, I think since towards the end of last year, we stepped it up uh, because for other products, we knew that people, you know, companies were changing uh, formulas or formulations on us. So we do more uh, post-marketing surveillance. So it, it sits well with the COVID-19 products. We had falsified chloroquine. Uh, Professor Newton mentioned that. Uh, without any active ingredient in it. Uh, and uh, of course, sanitizers, we had all those. We had fake masks, uh, which you know, we had to you know, deal with uh, regulatory wise. Uh, the pandemic as a whole has resulted in writing of some new guidelines and rewriting the existing ones. So it has come, COVID pandemic has come with its negatives and positives. Uh, but in terms of NAVDAC, uh, our regulatory activities have been heightened. It has been 24 seven, literally work uh, for many of the directorates. Uh, so with that, I want to say thank you uh, to Bloom uh, Public Health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adeye, for that um, insight into our approaches um, that NAVDAC has adopted to tackle the effects on the COVID-19 medical, medical products and supply chain. Thank you for that and I'll be coming back to you later. Ma. So Dr. Patrick, look quickly. could you take us through you know, what innovations are in place to ensure the uninterrupted supply of medical products and services in Africa? You have the floor, Dr. Patrick. Thank you very much, Yoma. And, um... I also want to extend a special thanks uh, to Bloom and to Lagos Business School for giving me this platform to really talk about uh, some of what I have seen as the lessons learned uh, from COVID. Um, I want to, but before I do that, I'd like to appreciate my fellow panelists. Uh, I want to appreciate Professor Adeyeyi for uh, holding a very big fort in Nigeria, uh, serving as the DG for NAVDAC. We all recognize and realize uh, how difficult this moment has been, but she has risen to the occasion. And for that, we are very appreciative of her sacrifice uh, in supporting and leading uh, her country's effort uh, against all the bad effects that would have uh, come as a result of COVID. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Paul Newton, uh, Paul is a veteran in the space of quality assurance and drug quality, and I appreciate all the work that I did with uh, Professor when I was heading the UCA program uh, in Washington. We did a lot of uh, great work in drug quality in Southeast Asia, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, etc. And finally, uh, mm -hmm. special thanks uh, to the professor from NIPRID, I think Professor Emeja, for the recent MOU that they established with Bloom. It is great to see a local institution uh, take charge and control really of helping to improve the drug quality space that we have been struggling with for so many uh, years. Uh, now back to the theme of, uh, of the, uh, the webinar. 
I would like to preface my presentation by the following statement. Uh, COVID uh, has clearly magnified the vulnerabilities of the various countries to the supply chain uh, and has, as a result, really brought to the fore all the issues that have existed already way before COVID. What COVID has done is really amplify the consequences of our inaction, if I can say that. Things that we should have been doing way before the emergence of COVID, it has now become obvious that uh, those things should have been tackled right from the beginning. I am going to really talk about building of local capacity and how we as Africans uh, could take advantage of this and build capabilities on the continent so that the next time another COVID hits, we can say that this time we are prepared. In doing that, uh, let me highlight a few of the vulnerabilities and the inadequacies that have existed in our supply chain and in the medicines quality uh, assurance space and uh, health technologies as well. First one, I think we have as a nation really failed to reward quality. One of the things that have always impacted the supply of medicines on the African continent is that there's often this narrative that we cannot patronize our local or domestic industries because they lack the quality that is required for these products. My assertion is that this is true to a large extent. While we know the quality standards, it is quite true that we have not enforced those standards over the years. And as a result, we have failed to meet the standards that are expected as other stringent regulatory bodies. The standards are well known. This is not rocket science anymore. The knowledge is there. I think it's really now left with us to enforce those standards so that we can start to elevate our game and show that we can perform at the same level that other developed countries can perform. How do you do that? How do you reward quality? You reward quality by tying procurement decisions to the organizations or the companies that are making concerted effort uh, to up their game. We must reward companies that are doing this. Otherwise, we end up disincentivizing those organizations that are trying to do the right thing. So this is really a clarion call to say, let's change the narrative and rise up to the occasion and do what we know. We know the standards. Let's enforce them and make them work. Second, we also don't patronize our industry. I mean, 70% of products are coming in from outside, but yet the idle capacity of companies is about 50%. What does this mean? This means that there's potential insight to develop these medical products, but yet those potentials are not being realized because the demand on them is not there. Why is the demand on them not there? Demand is not there because one, they cannot compete adequately with the external organizations. And secondly, the point I made about the quality, international donors are not patronizing them for that purpose. So this has to stop. We have to make sure that industry, domestic industry is strengthened so that we'll be in a better position whenever the next pandemic hits. We don't have to wait for shipments to arrive on the continent in order to uh, provide the right remedies for our people. Third, we often, our attitude to donation has to change. We ha there has to be a paradigm shift to donations of materials versus donation of know-how. I would say, I mean, some countries almost prepare to receive donations at the time of a pandemic. What we should be doing is donation of know-how. As the PPEs come from abroad, the next question we should be asking is, I want the know-how to make the PPE. And this way you are preparing yourself again for the next uh, pandemic. The last point I will make is on regulatory flexibilities. Professor Adeyeye talked about the emergency use authorization. Yes, indeed, African regulators were all invoking emergency use authorization, just like the developed nations did. But I want to say that perhaps the timeline on which we acted 
there is much to be improved upon. Because as you know, time is everything. Uh, if you don't act at the time where the things are very urgent, you will fail to avert catastrophes. We saw this in the United States, uh, where even in the U.S., because they were caught flat-footed, uh, the deaths are so high there. Later on, they cut off. So we have to increase the speed with which these emergency use authorizations are given. And finally, my final point is we also have to fight what I call the infodemic during an epidemic. There have been so many false claims about what can cure COVID and what doesn't cure COVID that our people have been left confused. We really have to also I think probably as a regulatory body uh, or ministries of health to embark on some serious infomercial educating our people as to how the system works, what we have to be careful of, what products uh, we have to take and what products we cannot take just because there are claims that they work. So let me end there uh, so that I will uh, give chance to the other speakers and hopefully we'll come back and address some of these in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation on innovations that we can adopt to um, ensure uninterrupted supply. We'll be back to you with some questions later. Now, Professor Paul um, Martin Semeje, this is the floor for you. Could you coming down to Nigeria? So, what innovations are in place? Just like um, Dr. Patrick has taken us around Africa, what are in place? to ensure the uninterrupted supply of uh, medical products and services in Nigeria. Okay, thank you very much, um, Chairman, and the panelists and our participants. Um, I appreciate Bloom and the Lagos Business School and all collaborators for the opportunity to be on this platform to share uh, my thoughts with us. Um, if you are a scientist in Africa and you are not angry, you are not a scientist. If you are a scientist in Africa right now and you are not angry, you are not a scientist. That is food for thought for us. But how can we be talking about innovations that are available in our continent or in our country to talk to take care of COVID-19? at the time of COVID-19. We are talking about innovations to take care of the disease that, that has come. That's not how to do innovations. You don't, you don't treat, I mean, in, in, in drug research, in development of products, it is not when you have the problem that you begin to run around that you want to solve the problem. That's not how research works. So there are no innovations available for COVID-19. You have heard from the DG Nabdaq. So, and did, did she tell you that she's registering any innovation in our country for COVID-19? She told you how she's um, registering products that are coming from abroad for COVID-19. I'm even surprised that people agreed to send it. If not that, they want to market their products, they, will, they should stop sending things to us, then we will know that we are supposed to do our own. Be then we will know that we are supposed to do research because those that are sending those things to us, they, the same brain that they have is what we have. Why are we not using our own brain to produce what we are importing? So, there are no innovations to, to, to take care of provision of medical products or services for, uh, uh, for COVID-19 uh, pandemic. What we have for me is utilization of what others have made or produced in order to ameliorate the suffering that has come with COVID-19. And why is it like this? I'd like to summarized by telling us that it is because research and development is not a priority. Research and development is not a priority. And any country that does not prioritize research and development will only be 
a market for countries that do research and development, and that is what we are. In fact, when I hear uh, heads of agencies like uh, DG NAVDAC, DG NIPRI, uh, political leaders talk about 70% of products being imported into Nigeria or Africa. I, I, I have been looking for where they study that shows that it's 70%. I can't even find the study. I think we are just trying to, to please ourselves by saying 70% is being imported. We are importing everything. We are importing everything. Let us tell ourselves so that we, be, we, we start doing, uh, working on how to stop importation because we must stop importation. If we don't stop importation, and I'm saying it in a plain language, that is not going to be uh, appealing to anyone because we must take that route, the route of let us do our own. And we can only do that through research and development. You cannot do innovation without research and development. It is through research and development that you do innovations. Now, COVID-19, PPEs, therapeutics or vaccines, I tell you that they can be done in Africa. We can make PPEs. We can develop our own drugs. But why are we not doing it? Well, maybe there'll be time to talk about that, but it's clear why we are not doing it. And, and I just he, um, uh, said one of the reasons why we're not doing it. Take Nigeria, for example. ASU has been on strike since COVID-19 started. And you want to do research and, and innovation, you want to do innovation? The, 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 the vaccines that everybody in Africa is waiting for, is it not university lecturers in other countries that are doing those, those studies? Is it not scientists and researchers? So how do you allow your universities to be at home, to close, and you are expecting products from research and innovation? You won't get. So we'll continue to sit and wait for what others do and then we use. And for those of us who are into this area, you know that no matter what happens, studies that are done in other places, the tendency that some of those outcomes will not be useful, will not be, I mean, to a large extent, useful in the environment is very high because of genomic differences. I mean, I mean, even in your country, the geographical and ethnic or racial differences affects drug, uh, 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 outcome of drugs or metabolism of drugs, therefore therapeutic outcome of drugs. That is why it's always important to do yours and, and then you try to also be in the space to export your products. So, look at the Central Bank of Nigeria it, has come, it, it came up with a 100 billion intervention fund for the pharmaceutical sector. So there was 100 billion somewhere before for, for, to, to help this pharmaceutical sector. Look, we, you know, when we give example of countries that stay side by side Nigeria, uh, some people don't want to hear. In 2018, was there COVID-19? But in 2018, India, India, had said we are giving the pharmaceutical sector 356 billion naira. That's their own, in, in, in naira terms, to develop what we call drug intermediates for active pharmaceutical ingredients. As we talk today, Nigeria does not produce any intermediate. We don't have any, and we have professors of, of chemistry. We have professors of pharmaceutical chemistry. People who will give you structures of vimblastine and vincristine that they did not allow us to sleep when we were in school. After studying all those structures today, who is producing any of those things? Now, Africa, Nigeria, we are rich in biodiversity. Our plant is everything. In fact, those of us who are into natural product research and development, we tell you, that there is no, no, that's why we should not, we should not be quick to, to condemn our 
traditional medical practitioners, when they say they can cure this, they can cure this, they can cure that. Because the truth is, there's no disease in your environment that the solution is not in your environment if you go cool down to utilize the natural resources that are available in that area. And thank God that there is, a, there is a, someone who believes in that, in charge of uh, uh, NAVDAC now, who believe, I believe, and a lot of us believe that one of the blessings of COVID-19 is that there's, go, there's now going to be emphasis on research and development. In fact, since I started research in Nigeria, this is the first time I'm hearing government, anytime they talk now, they mention research and development. Anytime they talk. In fact, since I've started working at NIPRI, I've never heard Nigerian government talk about NIPRI on national television more than two times. But we did this COVID time that mentioned NIPRI more than 55 times. So it's good that COVID-19 came. One, for up to three months now, nobody has traveled out of Nigeria. So we should all know that if we don't, if we don't start R&D in our country to produce what we need, we will be in, in trouble. Now, the, the, the intervention from, the, from CBN is a, good, is a good start, but because we have not been doing that, you see the gaps that are there. Look at who is supposed to monitor the, first of all, it is a loan that is going to be given. Then the pharmaceutical industries will have to go through banks, submit business plan to bank, bank will go to CBN, so the bank is being held responsible by the CBN, and then who does monitoring and evaluation? It is the same um, uh, CBN. They don't have an independent uh, group that are knowledgeable in, in MRE to, 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 to do monitoring and evaluation of those that they are going to give this fund. Check some other countries. Some of these loans are interest-free. Now, but because we have not been doing it, we didn't even know that we could give these loans that are interest-free. How do you encourage pharmaceutical industries to go into this? If you give them uh, 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 this loan and you are telling them to pay interest of 9%, so it could have been better if it is uh, interest-free. It could have been done better if you have independent monitors or, or people, experts, that will continue to monitor and build capacity of this industry in what to do, especially in, in the area of quality uh, assurance. Now, if you look at the, 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 one of the good things that is coming up in the pharmaceutical sector too that will encourage innovation is, is the pharma pack. Several Asian countries are already doing that. I mean, and we lack infrastructure. So one of the things that you do or you benefit from by having parks is when it is the shared utilization of resources, of infrastructure. You know we have problem of electricity, right? Let me tell you, Uttar Pradesh, for example, a state in, in, um, uh, in India, when it gave out about 250 acres of land free to, for drop part, it said we are providing free electricity, there will be free stamp duty, and it is interest loan the, uh, free. So you can see how to encourage the pharmaceutical sector. So why wouldn't they work? Why wouldn't they come up with what will benefit all of us? So as I, as, as I uh, uh, zero down on this for now, let me summarize by saying, do it yourself. First, do it yourself. We are in the if nobody needs to tell us again that we should do it ourselves. I hope we have all seen that it is possible for aeroplanes to stop flying and you will be confined to your country. Now we are all zooming. Are we not zooming now? Are we not doing zoom now? Okay. Aeroplanes stop flying. Did people die because aeroplanes stop flying? Do it yourself. Investment in local research and development. There is nothing, if there's no local, I'm calling it local because you domesticate it. Research is research anywhere in the world. But invest in R&D in your own environment, in your own country, in your biodiversity. 
we, we can get therapeutic agents, we can get drugs for any disease from our biodiversity, from the plants in Nigeria. We can get it. Okay? Immediately, a Bloom and Lagos Business School tell the government of Nigeria to tell lecturers to go back to, to class. It is not, look, the job of a lecturer is not just teaching students. They do research. That is where research is done. Basic research, sound research is supposed to be done by, by the university. You don't close the university at a time like this and be looking for Madagascar. The public health, we should now, we now know that public health is important. Growing up as a child in my village, in my typical village called Agaliga, there were people called the local health inspectors. We call them Odubangeli, where I come from. And what they do is they ensure that every household is clean. In fact, if they come to your family and there is any death around in your family, you are prosecuted by the local government. They no longer exist. So when we talk about people washing hands, if you go to villages, people know, a lot of people know how to, to do cleaning. So we should, um, uh, it is time, COVID-19. COVID-19 that is talking, we are talking about washing hands and, and um, uh, hygiene now. If these health inspectors were still in place, we would have much stress telling people that they should live a clean life. Agriculture is extremely important. Why is, and I'm connecting agriculture to health here, because our own area of strength, our own area of strength is in biodiversity, our plants, and that is agriculture. Thank you for now. Thank you very much, Professor Magic. Wow, I truly felt your anger as a scientist. You know, that was what you said to us, and um, I can imagine that we, we all felt your, your pulse. You're very upset as a scientist, and you have spoken very passionately. So we want to thank all our esteemed speakers. Thank you once again to our participants from all over the world for joining us. We had lots of questions from our participants at registration, and some of them, most of them guided the discussion as we've had so far. And we still have interesting ones here. So I'll go straight to um, our speakers. Professor Adeye, we have questions for you here. Um, one of the questions says, please, may we know the position of Nigeria on the use of Trump's hydroxychloroquine? Is it part of what Nigeria is using? Professor Deye, the question is for you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are some of the therapeutics that uh, Nigeria is using for clinical trial treatment only. Uh, we started with chloroquine and then hydroxychloroquine came in. However, uh, WHO suggested that hydroxychloroquine should be removed from the solidarity trial. And uh, Nigeria accepted that. However, there are clinical trials that started before solidarity trial began. Uh, Lagos State, for example, has uh, two arms uh, for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, many of us did not know anything about almost everybody until, uh, until about six months ago about COVID. The disease has three stages, at least that's what we know right now. Uh, the early stage, mild, and the severe stage. And it's not all the drugs or therapeutics that are there that can work in all the stages. Uh, it is uh, my belief and also some literature that point to the fact that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine work at the early stage of the disease, I mean early to mild stage. And remdesivir that uh, is now being used in the US 
is a drug product that works at the severe stage of the disease. So if chloroquine was used uh, for patients uh, that have the severe uh, COVID disease, it may not work. If they have heart conditions and, those, and that is not taken care of from the beginning in terms of monitoring the QT potential, it will not work. And uh, that may be part of the reason why it didn't work in the US. And also genetic polymorphism, the fact that it didn't work in the US doesn't mean it will not work in Africa. We've been using chloroquine and chloroquine or chloroquine-like for, for decades, for over 60 years. So genetic differences may also play in into the fact that it worked, it didn't work in the US. I don't know. Uh, the results, it, this is an, an interesting era or time in the sense that we know little about the COVID disease and which drugs will work, which drugs will not work. But thus far in Nigeria, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have been used in most uh, hospitalized settings or clinical trial treatments. Uh, isolation centers. In fact, there have been a lot of uh, social media uh, with videos of people who said, oh, I went in positive, uh, COVID positive, and I came back COVID negative, but all they gave me is anti-malaria. So we can figure that out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay, I think the next question would go to uh, Dr. Patrick. Um, we have lots, but I think this is pretty interesting. Someone wanted to know, what is the status of a collaboration, the status right now, you may have mentioned that, across the West African subregion and the AU, African Union, with respect to providing a locally sourced pharmaceutical solution for this pandemic? And maybe just the second one too, what is the use, what is the, what part would artificial intelligence play right now? And what should Nigerian engineers or African engineers be doing? Dr. Patrick. Thank you very much uh, for that. I'll do my best to uh, <laughs> see if I can address, address all of those. Um, okay. I try to focus my presentation really on the fact that we have failed as a continent in developing sufficient capabilities so that we can have self-reliance in times of emergency. I think I, I made the point that all of the issues that have plagued our medical uh, supplies, industries, and technologies have been there for a very long time. All COVID did was to put it in plain sight for us. What we have failed to do is to build sufficient human capital, is to build our institutions so that we'll be able to tackle any, if any, and really it's not a matter of if, but when the next pandemic is. So what do we see happening on the continent right now? I see a lot of collaboration between the various uh, regional World Health Organization uh, and the Geneva-based uh, WHO to try to see what lessons have been learned and how countries can actually build internal systems to work on this. One of the key initiatives that I have been following is how do we empower our local medical uh, industry so that they become a viable industry? There is an initiative now ongoing between African Development Bank uh, and various uh, regional economic blocks to try to set up a fund that would fund local medical industries so that they will be able to tackle this very important problem of lack of capacity. I'm very excited about that. What about artificial intelligence? I mean, obviously, I'm not an expert in AI, uh, but I have read a little bit around the subject. I mean, AI is not just for medical supplies industry, but it's being used mainly in healthcare, 
in the diagnostic uh, industry, et cetera. I don't know how much Africa has taken advantage of AI. Clearly, this is an attractive field. There's a lot of potential uh, in the area. But just like we have not taken advantage of building our local uh, pharmaceutical capacity, this is something that we have not even started to look at. We have not, it's just, we have not even touched that. As far as I see, from where I sit, there's a lot that has not been done in that area. That was the third question. If I forget, you can remind me. Thank you, Stu. No, I think both of them are basically on the AI, what, or what should engineers be doing? So I guess that just together, you know, what um, engineers it should be doing right now. And I think the question is to you because of you are a CEO of um, Tech for Health. So yes, I think but, not a, but not an engineer, I'm a pharmaceutical <laughs> scientist. So thank you. Okay. Okay, um, I think the last, my, one of the questions again will go to Professor Newton. Prof, uh, the question says, uh, I think this will be right for you because I remember again, by the way, Prof uh, Newton is um, a friend again as a, and a partner. And uh, thank you for all the collaborations. And I, uh, we so far have had some, I think two publications concerning this um, COVID-19 and calling attention of the global community on the impact of uh, falsified and substandard medicine. And I'm very glad and to know that, I know that Professor Muja Deyeye and my humble self happen to be part of a Paul's collaboration on the, on the publication on Lancet. So thank you, Paul, for all you do. So Professor Newton, this question is for you. What are the expectations in online pharmacies? Thank you very much, um, Dr. Choma. And uh, thank you all for your uh, wonderful uh, the collaboration uh, with our work together. Um, so online pharmacies are um, a major issue, especially for uh, falsified and substandard medicines. And as you know, I've never, I know very little about the situation in, in Africa, having spent most of my life in Asia. But I think a, a key thing will be um, what systems are in place within nation states for people to judge the reliability of online pharmacies. There are enormous problems in the UK with lots of falsified medicines, including for COVID. And the EU have developed a system for a, a logo that allows uh, reassurance that the pharmacy is what, who it says it is. But it just, it can't just be a logo. It has a the logo drills down into a website that confirms whether that pharmacy is or is not a reputable pharmacy. So I think it needs, um, uh, as Dr. MJ was saying, it needs uh, innovation to in Africa to try and work out how to protect customers from uh, online sites, which are likely to be all over the world uh, that are distributing poor quality products. So it needs um, AI and informatic systems to try and uh, protect people and for people buying online to uh, be very alert uh, to the problems that they may face. Uh, um, I hope that's um, uh, helpful, but I think it needs a lot more work to try and pr protect uh, uh, consumers and to make sh criminals will find a way around things, so to be always on one's guard to try and uh, ensure that the systems are as foolproof as possible. Thank you, over. Thank you very much, Professor Paul. So um, I'll be back to you, Professor Ebeje, Matis Ebeje. One of your questions is, um, what, what are the steps to follow in validating a cure? for COVID-19 from traditional medicine practitioners. And we, they want, people want to learn about new drug di discoveries to treat COVID-19. Are there new drug discoveries in Nigeria, traditional or herbal, and uh, to treat COVID-19? Could you tell us a little bit about that? And what steps are they to follow in validating a cure for COVID-19 from traditional medicine practitioners? You have the floor, Professor Martins. Okay, thank you um, very much. Uh, first of 
for there's a difference between traditional medicine and herbal medicine. People should always get that very clear. Um, every culture, every culture has a tradition. And in that tradition, there are ways where, whereby people take care of diseases in their own environment, in their culture. It is peculiar to that culture. And if you take the recipe or the method of taking care of an ailment from that culture to another culture, it might not work. So if you take Nigeria, for example, a, a traditional method of treating malaria in Yoruba land may not work in Hausa land. So that is traditional medicine. It's not herbal medicine. Herbal medicine is when we use herbs, when we use our plants. So let's separate the two very well. It is usually very difficult to, sign, to, to, to put a scientific proof on traditional medicine. In fact, there are, some, there are some things about traditional medicine that science will never be able to explain. I quickly, let me give you an example quickly. It, it, it is possible for somebody that have a compound or complex a fracture who is supposed to be amputated in the hospital for them in my village, for the person not to be amputated, and the traditional medical doctor in my village, we, 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 we break the leg of a cock and then and, and walk on the cock and the person will be healed. Science will never be able to explain it. That's traditional medicine. So let's leave what we cannot explain. Let's, let's, let's be interested in what we know and how we can do it. And herbal medicine, we know it. How do we screen for COVID-19? COVID-19 is a disease. It's a viral disease. It's not different from other viral diseases. The difference is that the, this is new, it's not known. When HIV came and we did not know it, it was the COVID-19 of that time now. When malaria came and it was not known and it was killing military people in, those, in, in centuries ago, it was the COVID-19 of that time. So the method of developing drugs for COVID-19 is not different from developing drugs for malaria, okay? The principle is the same, but the disease is different. And when the disease is different, how we go about to develop the product is also different. Right now, we do not have the capacity, and please, I'm choosing my words very well, we do not have the capacity to screen for COVID-19 right now, but we have the capability because we have a, a, enough trained personnel, professors, PhD holders in, in around, all over, in our research institutions and in our universities that know what to do. Capacity is not the job of that scientist. Capacity is the job of government and the private sector. So there are already protocols on what to do. And that is a lesson for people who study pharmacy and drug development that we will not be able to cover on this uh, webinar on how to do drug discovery and drug development. Okay, so I don't think it is, um, it's, it's international best practice, the protocol is available if you can even read it any, anywhere, but the experience on what to do when you lay your hand on something that you want to investigate and see how it will turn out to become a pharmaceutical product is well known, experts in that area, pharmaceutical scientists in, in that area, uh, chemists in, 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 in those areas, chemical engineers, and all is this multidisciplinary, you know, in all of that, especially for us in this um, natural product area, because from there we have botanists, um, uh, those that major in herbarium, you have, um, you know, biologists, you have agriculturists, and all of that, biotechnologies, we all come to together in the discovery of that. I think, is that uh, the second question? No. Okay. No, that's fine, sir. That's fine. Thank you very much um, to our dear speakers. Um, I'll be back to one of our speakers, uh, Tayo Hamzat from WHO. Tayo, could you share um, World Health, the World Health Organization's uh, experiences and activities as regards uh, this medical, uh, the theme of our discussion today. And let me start by thanking the Bloom's Public Health and the Lagos Business School. This is a, a very important discussion and uh, very timely to our situation in Africa and in Nigeria particularly. Uh, for the pandemic response, uh, WHO has been working 
within the framework of global humanitarian response, which include medicines and technology. And uh, in doing this, uh, let me start by saying, WHO gives advices, and I like what Professor uh, Muji said when she was talking about chloroquine and uh, the solidarity trial. She said WHO suggests. So we give suggestion in our normative work. Uh, so in leading this uh, pandemic, we have been sending out uh, advices, normative uh, uh, issues and guidances to countries on how to proceed. And it is for countries to now domesticate it somehow to see what fits into their situation. This is because it's taken into consideration uh, the differences, the variations within countries. And like Professor Martin's immediate response, the issue of traditional medicine in, in Africa will be treated quite differently from what, it's, what they do in other parts of the world. So, but for COVID response, one, you know, WHO has been giving, uh, sending out a lot um, of standard and, uh, and uh, falsified medical products related to COVID-19. And we have specific alerts on chloroquine products circulating in Africa and some other uh, parts of the world. For example, there are scams websites going on now, which are uh, uh, they, they, they exhibit ventilators, for example, that are actually fake. So WHO is trying to monitor all this and uh, helping countries giving guidance. But to actually streamline this, uh, WHO in, with other UN agencies system, it is a single supply porter as the response continuous supplies are source. This is because as the, as the uh, pandemic progresses, commodities and technologies become challenged in terms of availability and the use of procurement. And this is one of the triggers for falsified, uh, substandard and falsified medical products. Once there is the demand and there is no uh, 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 commodities available, available for people to procure, the falsifiers, people who make fake products, they, they, they leverage on that and bring in substandard and falsified products into the market. So this uh, supply system allows countries to start from developing their incident uh, action plan and from there, their quantification, which is now put into the system. This is just opposed and triangulated with the population of each of these countries. And then WHO have uh, suppliers who are verified, who have been pre-mobilized to go and make productions and you can now access uh, these commodities. Of course, it may not be enough, so it is rationed to countries based on your need, considering your needs and the availability of this product. So we believe this will allow for uh, countries to have access and this time around, an equitable access to uh, uh, safe and efficacious uh, uh, products that we now limit the effect of the substandard and falsified products in the system. So in line with that, the WHO Regulation and Pre-Qualification Unit is collaborating with regulators worldwide to provide a platform for rapid exchange of information. And in doing this, there is direct communication on cl the clinical trials, on the issue of products that are available and in exchange fast tracking uh, accreditation of these uh, products. Meanwhile, it is the responsibility of the National Regulatory Authority, in this our case, NAVDA, to actually validate this product and uh, accept them into their market. But they will have access to uh, information. Also, and find my final point, in doing this, WHO recently, the Regional Office for Africa, recently organized a virtual regional meeting on COVID-19 uh, regulatory. Uh, round up on 22nd of uh, 
of May, and there the, 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 the intention, uh, what was what was the target was to discuss impact of COVID-19 on regulators' work and implementation of the uh, of mitigation measures. We will they share experiences on the response in terms of communication, assessing application for COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics, issuing regulatory decision. Also, the updates were provided on approaches of WHO uh, to most of the issues. And uh, it's, it's, it was also intended to facilitate regulatory response to COVID-19 in the African region. And uh, one of the follow-up team is that the WHO International Medicine uh, Unit is developing a model for clinical trials uh, protocol, and we intend to disseminate it in very, in very soon. And then the work in Madagascar on COVID organics, and people have mentioned it here, that Africa needs to produce their own solutions. So WHO is working with Madagascar. On, and supporting them to generate evidence that will show that this vaccine is safe, safe, efficacious, and is actually targeting and giving results that we, the claims are saying. So this is ongoing. And I recently I know that the Blue is setting up an expert committee across Africa to actually uh, complete, uh, complete this work. So these are the few things we have done, but it remains a fact, like uh, Professor Martin Sinegi said, that our response in Africa should come from us. The solution should come from us. And that is what the Regional Office of the World Health Organization uh, in Africa is supporting. And we need, governments needs to come up and bring up policies, an idea, not even policies, because I do know that most African countries have enough policy documents, but it is the implementation. Even when there are support from agencies to governments to do this, it is the implementation that, we, we, that is the challenge. For example, in Nigeria, we do know that there was some time ago an intervention fund from the government of Nigeria, from the previous regime. Throughout the period of that intervention, it was difficult for pharmaceutical companies to assess the fund. So if those funds are available, WHO is in support of developing local capacity in terms of production. Nigeria is utilizing less than 30% of our stock capacity in production. When I came on board in WHO, one of the first assignments we did with NAVDA was to assess how we can improve on local capacity. And because that came up because four Nigerian companies got the GMP certification then. But where are they to now? The support was not just there in terms of encouraging them to improve on this. Quality is expensive, but countries do come up. Professor Martin Semeja referred to India the other time the support they give. And that is what WHO will not come to give such support. But when that support is available, the technical assistance go to the National Regulatory Authority, in this, in this case, NAVDA, and to the production companies themselves, WHO will provide that. And I would like to end by saying COVID-19 is an opportunity for us to trace our track and go back to our source. WHO Regional Office for Africa is available to support countries to develop local capacities, like Prof said. Plus the capabilities in Africa and WHO do believe in this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tayo, for that beautiful end up. If in just summary, Patrick just let us know, or call our attention to the fact that COVID-19 only amplified the consequences of our uh, inaction. And Professor Paul noted that, noted in his own um, trying to sort out or take us through the effects of uh, COVID-19, he called our attention to the risk of shortages, the influence of uh, this on our healthcare delivery, the proliferation of substandard and falsified medicines and diagnostic tests, 
from unregulated uh, supply chain, risking, if we're not careful, the parallel pandemic again. And again, the version of drugs of interest for other medical treatments to focus on COVID-19. Um, Professor Adeye yeah, took us through what NAVDAC is doing you know, to tackle the challenges posed by COVID-19 on the medical products and technologies. And she highlighted the summary, the need for a reduced reliance on any one region for the significant proportion of our essential raw materials. She talked about, of course, there is need for increased intra-regional alliance. She mentioned the uh, expedited but meticulous approval that had to come in place is now cut down to 10 days for approval of uh, products. Even talked, uh, called uh, Nigeria's attention to um, Nigeria's attention to the online approvals that intensifies to, to intensify approval of uh, products. And um, yeah, and we rely now on products from regulatory agencies for those that we could not, um, um, we we might not be able to have approvals for in Nigeria. Now, NAFTAC relied on regulatory agencies with stringent reviews and probably do a dusk review in country before we start using them here. And she talked about new guidelines that have been written, but I'm happy Tayo um, called our attention to something that Nigeria, we have lots of guidelines and um, protocols, policies. They are not our, our issues here, but implementation is often the challenge in Nigeria. And so in essence, uh, well, Patrick talked about this is a clarion call for us to focus on donation of know-how rather than donation of goods and supplies. And I know everybody here felt the pulse of uh, Professor Emeje, where he says, if you're a scientist in Nigeria, you're not angry, you are not yet a scientist. And for us in Bloom, we are currently galvanizing support of relevant stakeholders to encourage local manufacturing of health products in Nigeria, especially pharmaceuticals, while making available the needed technical backbone. I'm, I'm, I'm glad Dr. Professor Martins talked about the pharmaceutical pack that is being led by Bloom. And this is the reason for the MOU that um, Bloom has entered into with likes of uh, NIPRID and the National Association of Industrial Pharmacists, in addition to other collaboration opportunities that Bloom Public Health is currently working on. Bloom Public Health is also spearheading the establishment of, uh, of pharmaceutical parks, as I've mentioned in Nigeria, that will be supported with an enabling supply chain network upon completion. With this, we want to say a big thank you to you, our speakers for today, Professor Adeye, the DG of Navdak Ma. We say a big thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Paul Newton, we say thank you from the University of Oxford. Despite you your much. very um, tight schedules. And Professor you Martin Zemeje of uh, Nightbridge, thank you for being around today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tayo Hamzat from WHO. Thank you for having me. So, in a special way, we thank our co host, Lagos Business School Sustainability Center. It's indeed an honor and a privilege to, to work with you. And our partners, World Health Organization Nigeria. Nigeria Health Watch, IQVIA, and to you, our dear participants. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. And Dr. Patrick Lukle, thank you for coming on board. Best us next time. So have a good day. That will be the end for now. <laughs>